Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now after resolving all that was wrong with my cheap FX motherboard bundle in the last video, I wanted to see what the FX 4300 could do these days. You're looking at an average cost of around 25 to 35 pounds dollars or euros for one of these chips, and once you've factored in the DDR3 RAM and motherboard, it makes even less sense as both the 200GE and 3000G modern Athlon chips will perform better and are available on a newer and currently supported platform that won't cost you much more, if any more at all. At the top end of the AM3 Plus platform, the FX8350 and 9590 for example are still capable chips, but again not the wisest of investments in late 2019. Then again, those on a tight budget might be tempted and to be honest, the 4300 did better than I was expecting in today's results. As with all CPUs I test, I edit and render my videos with them. To give you an idea of what using the tested component at hand for a day is really like. My chosen program is Premiere Pro 2015, and whilst render and export times won't blow you away, completely the opposite in fact, there are no major holdups when chopping up and reorganising your clips, and the full resolution playback preview is smooth enough too. As a cheap editing CPU, this may do someone on a tighter budget a good turn. I should also mention that this one is overclocked to 4.4 GHz. I started off at 4.6, but halfway through the Cinebench R20 test, our system froze, as you can see here, followed by a blue screen. I've heard stories of 5 GHz FX4300s, but it's always luck of the draw, and I seem to draw the short straw more often than not. I'm not sure how much of a real world difference a higher overclock would make these days with this chip, as it's still going to be the limiting factor in our tests. In the multicore test, it came in just shy of a 200GE Athlon at stock speeds, though that CPU can also be overclocked, and the gap in that case will increase even more performance-wise. For general usage and everyday tasks, the FX4300 is still enough. So for the games, well, I was quite surprised in some areas, but as you'll see in CPU intensive titles, issues do arise. The Outer Worlds, for example, does not agree with this chip. I've paired it with my good old heat generator, the Vega 64 and 16 gigs of 1600 MHz DDR3. Starting outside the settlement of Edgewater and the frame rate was okay, but there will be some noticeable FPS drops. You can also see that the CPU hits 100% usage a lot as well. I then tested the performance inside the town's walls, and the whole thing reminds me of the unpatched Diamond City in Fallout 4 in terms of performance issues. I'm not even sure if they ever fixed that properly. There are frequent drops as the processor struggles to deal with what I'm throwing at it. If you're playing as a good guy though, there will definitely be less of the intensive blasting. That's not an acceptable summary though really, is it? Uh, yeah, if you just don't do anything, the frame rate will be fine. <laughs> Red Dead Redemption 2, on the other hand, cares more about what graphics card you have and as such ran okay on the 4.4GHz FX4300. I'm inclined to say that your best bet with this CPU in 2019 is playing at a locked 30fps in most titles to keep things as steady as possible. I'm slightly more inclined to say that you should just look out for a used Ryzen 3 1200 instead if your budget is tight. Turning things down from high to medium didn't really have any effect, positive or negative, as the processor is still maxing out a lot, but I can honestly say that this title did better than I thought it would going into the tests. I then threw Metro Exodus into the ring and was once again surprised by the result. Now in the real world, this chip would be best paired with say a RX 560, GTX 1050 or maybe even a GTX 1650, and of course any similar performing equivalent, new or old, as anything more would be a waste but the Vega helps the CPU reach its maximum potential. Metro Exodus seemed to do okay, albeit with a few expected drops. People always say the FX series is horrible, but as someone here on YouTube once said, I wish I could remember who, there are no bad components, only bad prices. And I think when considering that the FX 4300 is probably still a little bit high in 2019. 
I know it's only £25 or whatever here in the UK, but knock another fiver off that and it would be all the more tempting to someone with a smaller budget to build a system. Kingdom Come Deliverance is next, a game I just can't stop playing at the moment. The game was playable, but again there will be a few dips or micro freezes. If you stumble across an FX4300 for cheap, I think this goes to show that you shouldn't recoil in horror at the thought of buying it, but I'd certainly make sure it's the 4300 and not the 4100. The same goes for the 6 and the 8 series. They're also pretty willing over clockers too. Back to the game and indoor areas as expected will give you the best results, but also bear in mind that built up outdoor areas could prove more problematic than what you're seeing. I'm enjoying using this chip though, it feels wrong to say, but today it seems to have done okay. Finally, and I don't know why I bother, it's Dirt Rally 2.0. At this point I'm starting to think this game would run fine on a Pentium D chip from the early 2000s. It just does not care about what processor you have, as long as your graphics card is up to the job. What you've seen here today is just a small handful of games and I have no doubt that some titles will run horribly on the FX lineup, but from what I've seen it's still usable especially if you don't plan on gaming all that much. Just don't go pairing it with a Vega GPU or anything silly like that and consider other newer options and their prices first, such as the new Athlons or maybe second hand first gen Ryzen chips. Intel's modern hyper-threaded Pentiums are also worth looking out for, but to be honest I think they're priced a little too high to purchase brand new. Okay, since recording the first half of the video I've had a few more hours with the chip and there are a few more things I want to expand on. To start with, I experienced a couple of games that gave me pretty significant problems, Rage 2 and Battlefield 5. Rage 2 didn't start up for me despite numerous attempts. This could just be my machine, so take that with a pinch of salt. Battlefield 5 did start and run, but I experienced tremendously long loading times with this title. Actually getting to the main menu for starters took about 5 minutes from the moment the game launched, and then loading a story mission took about the same time again. This was continuous no matter what story mission I chose. I've noticed this with a few older processors, and it's something I felt I should mention, because Battlefield 5 is still a very popular title for both the single player and multiplayer experience. Furthermore, there are certain times when I feel like the FX here is on the cusp of playable and unplayable. It's sort of right on the line. Take any of today's games for example, well except Dirt Rally 2 which as I mentioned runs on absolutely anything. In some areas you may see frame rates that are fairly impressive or meet and exceed your expectations and other times you may be left disappointed. Look at Red Dead Redemption 2. The results were okay and so was the average frame rate on the part of the map I tested. I have no doubt that venturing into a town like Valentine or a city like Saint Denis would have a larger impact on the numbers. The reason I'm mentioning this specifically with this chip, despite the fact it could apply to many others, is because this CPU as I said before is particularly skittish if you will, like a level 1 horse on Red Dead while we're on the subject. This is why I mentioned the whole lock it to 30 FPS thing before as well. One moment you might find yourself seeing 40 frames per second, then the next you may find yourself all the way down at 27. This will be more noticeable with an uncapped frame rate, and if there is no chance of hitting 60 with this CPU and your chosen graphics card, then capping the frame rate may be worth considering in order to get what seems like smoother performance. I think that because of these factors, 2020 will be the year that the FX4000 series will truly meet its maker, at least with newly released AAA games, maybe not right away, but toward the end. Yes, it did surprise me because I thought it would now be totally incapable, especially in things like Metro Exodus and Red Dead. Buy with caution, but know that if you have £25 or $30 to spend on a CPU, it should at least be considered, even if you don't end up actually purchasing one. If you need a secondary machine for work or school, maybe play a few retro games like San Andreas or Half-Life 2, by all means it could be your next ideal chip, but as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. Do you still have one of these? Have you just bought one of these? Have you been running with one of these for the last five or six years? 
please leave your comments down below in the comments section and let me know what sort of games you play on your FX processor if you have one as well and what your frame rates are like because I'd love to hear all about it. All that's left to say is that if you enjoyed this video please leave a like on it down below, if you didn't enjoy this video leave a dislike on it down below, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hopefully I shall see you all in the next video which should be out before the end of the year. Thank you and good night.